Oh, I've got a big question for you today. So where does art come from? Does it come from something internal? Does it come from something external outside of us? Um, is it something that's fully formed out there in the universe somewhere? And then we just got to connect with it and co-create with the, you know, the muses or the angels or the whomevers. Ah, big questions, man. I don't think we're going to solve it in 15 minutes, but let's think about it. Hey, good morning, lovely people of the planet. This is Jeff O. This is the Morning Ride Pedal Powered Podcast. We're just trying to uh, talk through ways and uh, mysteries of evolving as filmmakers, as poets, as human beings. I'm just a dude on a bike, y'all. I don't know nothing. <laughs> I am super interested in this, though, because I'm trying to make my first film, and I'm really wrestling with it. And so... Um, I, uh, I reread Stephen Pressfield, The Art of War, yesterday. We were coming back from Texas, helping the ladies move a little bit. A little bit. We helped them move a lot. They're moving from Texas to Idaho. I'm so excited for them to get here. So excited to be closer to them. But we were... Uh... So that's where we were. We got back, had a three-hour flight, direct flight, thank goodness. Hey, good morning. Hey, good morning. All right, so this is all new trail through here. I haven't been on this part of the trail yet, so let's, let's see what happens here. So I was reading Stephen Pressfield's The War of Art. It's, I highly recommend it for creatives and artists, especially if, you're, um, if, you've, if you've done work and you're kind of stuck, um, like I am with this film project, you know. I, I am a writer, I am a poet, I have made some video, I've done some video production that's, you know, decent work, um, but I'm trying to get into the artistic side of it. And uh, it's a new thing for me, you know, like inventing my own worlds. And um, wow, this is gorgeous over here. Look at this. Yeah, this is all new, part of the new park over here. Thought we'd come this way this morning since uh, we're working from home today, so to speak. But it's interesting to me how, um, if you read the poetry of uh, folks in my generation especially, hey, good morning on your left. There are, there's a group of us, and we don't know one another. Well, for the most part, I know that I don't know any of them, but we really don't know one another, and uh, we don't hang out together. We probably read a lot of the same books were probably inspired by a lot of the same ideas. Um, our poetry typically is around mystery, wonder, and love. I'm saying like on the big ideas there. But we all started doing this thing about 15 years ago in poetry where we invert syntax or we switch, hey, good morning on your left, switch our nouns and verbs around. Um, I remember one of the first, hey, good morning, sir. One of the first poems I wrote in this mode was what eventually became one, one More Phone Call or The Astronomer's Daughter Poems. Still trying to work that out. But basically what it is, is the, uh, let's see if I can remember that original line was something like, the blue heron, yellow onions, the grocery water, yellow onions, the blue heron, yellow onions, the grocery water, I think, it was something like that. Now, obviously, that did not come fully formed and uh, making any kind of sense, any kind of logic sense. Um, and I was fascinated by this. I mean, it just, it changed the way that I approached language and writing because it's like, wow, poetry is made of parts. What is the material, materiality of poetry? Well, it's language. Man, it is so gorgeous over here. Look at this place. This is fantastic. We're coming back to take photos. <laughs> That's right. Oh, this is awesome. So this is all part of the new Whitewater Park. For those of you who are watching the video, you can see it. You can hear it. Probably for those of you who are just listening along. I appreciate you being here. By the way, how was your weekend? What did you do? Did you have a chance to get out on your ride at all? I hope so. It's a great time of year to be on your ride into summer. 
Getting out of those summer blues maybe a little bit. Hey, good morning on your left or behind you. They were highly engaged in convivial conversation. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, so this is all just kind of a cruise to the park over here, isn't it? It's just a ride in the park. Well, why don't we do that today as we go through this list? So one of the things that Pressfield came, comes up with, and I've got my notes here, so let me see if I can see these. It's like he was talking about where did the ideas come from? Like, where does the idea for Beethoven's Fifth Symphony come from? Or like uh, Shakespeare's Hamlet? And <clears throat> how did these artists connect with, with whatever they connected with to find this? So part of um, this, this part of the book, The War of Art, that he's talking about is... Uh, Connecting with the muses, and I want to—I really want to get into that, those ideas uh, around ritual and um, giving thanks, you know, as part of your ritual, your art ritual, your art making process. Hey, good morning on your left here. That's why whenever I come. <laughs> yeah, I'm confused by all these lovely winding trails. I have no idea where I am. This is fantastic. How often does that happen? So he was talking about this, and he brought up this example from William Blake, and it's a quote. Um, Eternity is in love with the creations of time. And, and this is Pressfield's breaking it down, and I, I love this because I've been a fan of Blake for many, many years. I have not done a deep dive into Blake because he gets um, really esoteric. It's, you know, it's old English, so it's tough going anyway. Um, but man, I love his mystic ideas. And so in, eternity is in love with the creations of time. And what Blake, according to Pressfield, was kind of getting at is that eternity is some other realm. It is not human and it is not bound by time. That is eternal, right? Eternity. And um, so what he is suggesting is the idea that Blake was getting at, the idea that there are the, the muses out there, like um, the daughters of Zeus and Nemosene. Am I saying that correctly? They had nine daughters. Hey, good morning. Coming around your left. Thank you. And they had the nine daughters, and those were the muses, and those were the, uh, the, the beings that then would inspire humans to make things for their in amusement. Amusement, right? Amusement, that's where the word muses comes from. Wow, oh, we're going off road. We've never done this on the morning ride, have we? And so Pressfield broke this down that the eternal is another realm that is in love with, that means it has this capacity to understand, to perceive, and to enjoy in some way, to love, to be in love with, the creations of time. So that is, um, you know, the gods created the heavens and earth, right? No matter what tradition we're talking about, whatever mythology you're talking about, you know, heaven was made by some god, um, you know, either some form of raven or coyote in a lot of the American myths, Native American myths is so we call them, but really they are <laughs> American because they were in America before us. So they're not Native Americans, they're Americans. Where did I read that recently? That was so funny. Um, and so a lot of people nowadays, of course, we talk about this as consciousness, you know, like when you get into more of the uh, Buddhist traditions. Uh, we talk about, you know, in the mystic Buddhist traditions, primarily over the, like, Zen Buddhism, the more intellectual traditions. Talk about this as the muses talk about that there are other realms that we can connect with. And so, one of the things that I have always felt is that art exists in this realm somewhere beyond myself. Now, if we break down that idea of Jung, that there's the self, 
which covers a large space. And then there's the ego, which is a small space within the self. And the ego is primarily designed to keep us alive. I mean, like back in the old days, but now we've run out of like, you know, I'm riding along a dirt trail near a river, but I'm not too worried about a bear coming out and getting me. I'm not worried about a saber toothed tiger or a dinosaur stepping on me. I'm not too worried about those things. So my, my ego these days gets preoccupied with, well, what do I wear to fit in socially as a professional? Or what do I wear to fit in with the crowd? Or what do I wear to not fit in with the crowd? So my, my ego does stupid stuff now that doesn't really have much to do with like ultimate survival, but it is the survival in the context of an information age, right? That we're living in now. So when I believe that when I'm working on art, that I'm working to, oh, well, these are the portage paths where people can portage their boats from the river back up through. Man, this place is amazing. This is amazing. I was saying how we needed flow trails through here, but uh, I don't think we do. We've got all these flow trails, but they're just for boats and, and uh, surfboards, I guess. Hey, good morning. So today in the scientific world, sorry folks, we kind of went to sleep there or something, didn't I? So today in the scientific world, of course, we talk about eternity very differently. Um, you know, a lot of scientists nowadays are uh, having worked from Einstein's theory of relativity back in, what was that, 1905, 06, something like that. Having worked back from that, a lot of people are saying, well, you know, time really maybe doesn't exist and it really is more about space, which falls, of course, in very much in line with the idea of, um, of the eternal, is that there is no such thing as time. It's a thing that happens for us because, relative to us, we have time because we live for a while and then we're dead. So that makes time. <laughs> I think it's uh, how, what, what a lot of the new physicists are talking about. But then, so everything exists in space, in a space. And of course, as we know, there are different mediums within even the space of the planet Earth, right? Like, uh, right now, I'm going through an atmosphere of air that, thank goodness, is suitable for breathing. <laughs> we can also swim in water. That's another kind of atmosphere, right? There's all kinds of electromagnetic radiation all around us all the time. We've got radio waves, we've got Wi-Fi waves. You know what? We're gonna chill out while we're crossing the bridge because it's just too noisy up here. Hey, good morning. We know that a lot of scientific research has been done in the uh, realms of the poltergeist, <laughs> in the spiritual realms where they have found that certain low frequency beta waves can be perceived as ghosts or people who have not gone on or people from before who are disembodied for some reason. So there's a lot of scientists, a lot of science that explains the experience that a lot of ancient folks have known for a long, 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 long time which then goes back to the original question, is where does art come from? Obviously, there is some reverberation of the planet that we experience, like, and I'm talking especially like music, it's an easy example to demonstrate this, is that music sounds a certain way on our planet because of the gravitational pull of the planet, the weight of the planet, um, how quickly it revolves around the sun. You know, this determines what the wind sounds like, this determines the frequency of the planet, like what are its cycles? And surely those cycles produce reverberations that are so long and slow that we cannot hear them, but as they speed up, they become sound. In the same way that when sound speeds up, it becomes light. Now, that's not to say that light and sound are different. Light is perceivable through our 
through listening, whereas, no, <laughs> sound is perceivable through listening, whereas, hey, good morning, whereas light is only perceivable through the vision, through visual, unless you've got some sort of great, um, oh man, what do they call that? Oh, synesthesia effect in your life where you can taste a particular sound or taste a color or see a sound. Uh, but basically, you know, a certain frequency of uh, a certain frequencies we see, certain frequencies we hear, certain frequencies we smell. It's, it's really fascinating and, it's, and, it's, and all that is highly calculable. But back in the old days, before we could say, oh, well, this spectrum, you know, is sound. And then, you know, there's a little spectrum between the two that, you know, you can't really hear anymore, but, you know, we're not able to perceive it yet as a sight. We're trying to mix the mystic and the scientific here, folks. <laughs> anyway, I believe that there is a thing. I believe that, you know, and back to the, the Jung sense of self, is that when, when I can subvert my ego, when I have uh, a personal life practice as a human being to subvert my ego, that I'm acting as my better self and have more access to my higher self. In the same way that when I am practicing my writing, when I'm getting up and writing every day, that um, the writing happens a lot more easily. What Pressfield talks about in The War of Art is the idea that by interceding with the muses, you get their attention and you say, look, I'm working really, really hard here. Can you, uh, you know, have you got anything for me today? Hey, good morning. And they may reply <laughs> yes, and they may reply no. We don't know. That's the mystic part of it. That's the exciting part. That's why the showing up is the only thing that matters. Um, I'm forgetting who said it. It was from Babylonia, maybe? That, uh, no, it's from the Bhagavad <laughs> I'm sorry, I always butcher that word. That we are entitled to our work. We are not entitled to the fruit of our work. We're entitled to our labor. We're not entitled to the fruit of our labor, necessarily. If that makes any sense to you. That it's only the work that we can do. It's only the work that we are responsible for. And when it produces something great, that's fantastic. When it produces something that isn't great, that's also fantastic because it's still the work. So the idea that Blake has for us in his example is that eternity is in love with the creations of time, I think is to say that the eternal realms have something, feel something for us, or maybe they're indifferent to us and just use us, but that they perceive us and we're part of them. And that if we are practicing, hey, good morning, if we are in our practice, that they may uh, feel for us and throw us a bone, a little bit of inspiration, a little bit of art. Folks, I hope that you have a fantastic day. This is all I've got for us today. If you are interested in this conversation, continue this conversation. I would love to continue this with you on Twitter or Instagram at Morning Ride Pod. I know it's absolutely ridiculous, but that's what happens when you get a big long title for your project. <laughs> um, hey, folks, if you enjoy riding a bicycle, get out on a bicycle. Thanks so much for riding with me today. I hope that you have a fantastic morning. I look forward to riding with you again on Thursday. Again, hit me up on Twitter and Instagram if you have some ideas on uh, where art comes from. I really believe that it is a thing outside of ourself that through practice and maybe through some bit of thankfulness to the universe that uh, you know we're allowed access to. And maybe it's just in the form of inspiration. Maybe it's not something fully formed. I know that some of the poems I've written early on were really fully formed. That still happens every once in a while. It's a mystery, and I, I love uh, being engaged with that mystery, um, trying to stay attuned to my higher self because I find that um, I end up having a greater love for the people around me when I'm in tune with myself, and I make art that I tend to enjoy a lot more. So this is just my experience, folks. I really appreciate you being here as part of the discussion, listening in with me. Um, I hope that you have a fantastic day. If you love riding a bicycle, 
whatever your bicycle is, get out on it, because this is the only ride we get.